just wanted to invite folks, in case you didn't see it in the email that came out earlier this week um, or didn't see it in the, the chats and, and haven't um, uh, come upon it, uh, we are trying to encourage folks during the time that we're working on this um, way of love uh, to, to do so with a group of other folks. Uh, some of you are already in small groups or house groups and, um, and that's great. And hopefully this is something that um, those groups can take up if, if that seems helpful for them. But one of the things that we saw last week um, with Kate Maxwell was how having a rule of life is really a thing you do in community. And so as we're thinking about what is a rule of life, what are the pieces of my rule of life, what are my priorities, um, in some ways that's a, that's a process of discernment, a process of listening to God, a, a process of um, listening to ourselves. Um, and traditionally that's happened in the church in a community with other folks that you trust, that you, you walk that path together. So um, we want to facilitate as much as possible uh, folks joining together to over the next uh, nine months or so through now, from now through June, uh, meeting together however often seems good for you and in whatever format seems good for you uh, to, to just really walk together uh, to think about these questions and uh, work toward walking the way of love uh, that, that Jesus embodies and also instructs and that um, you can get in touch with either me or Craig uh, and we'll have another little email reminder coming out about these things and actually you, some of you will be hearing from me um, you know, via email personally and I know a couple of you have already gotten in touch with me. But, uh, but other folks who, who haven't yet taken that opportunity, just um, happy to try and connect you with folks um, who, who can walk with you in this, this path during this time. So that's my plug. Thanks, Judy. Well, let's plunge right in, shall we? Um, if it's all right, I'll open us with a word of prayer. Let us pray. O oh God of peace, who has taught us that in returning and rest, we will be saved. In quietness and confidence will be our strength. By the might of your spirit, lift us, we pray. Lift us. Sorry, I lost you all there for a second. And I, I'm sure God is still with us. So I'll continue our prayer. Lift us, we pray, to your presence where we may be still and know that you are God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. I'll ask you all to go ahead and mute your microphones if you haven't already. And um, wanted to uh, use today, as was designed by uh, the Formation Commission, to use today as a chance to kind of wrap up this introductory time together. We've had a chance to hear uh, sort of what the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church envisioned when, uh, when he and uh, members of the Episcopal Church launched this idea of the way of love. Um, we've had a chance to hear from Dr. Judy Stack about some of the scriptural and historic underpinnings of where a way of love and particularly a way of life or a rule of life might come from and how we might pursue that. We've heard last week about um, what a rule of life is most practically and, and uh, some, perhaps some ideas about where it shows up already in our lives and how we could build one. And over the next uh, nine months or eight months, uh, with taking a break, of course, for Advent, but over the course of eight months, we'll be looking with really great intensity at each of the practices of the way of love. And we'll have an opportunity to kind of uh, poke at it, examine it, um, inquire it, uh, find out where it fits already in our own lives, where it's showing up, then we'll have an opportunity to, uh, to sort of apply it. 
Um, at no point in this process are you forbidden from creating your rule of life. So if you want to start now and to have built your rule of life and then be examining it alongside the, the way of love material as you go, that's fine. For some of you, it might be easier to go through this nine month and sort of use it as a time of discernment to sort of fine tune and really determine what you think your rule of life will be. Um, it may be that you already have one and you're here just to refresh and to renew your sense of, of joy in having a rule of life. Um, but as we begin today, I wanted to, to sort of pull us back to basics uh, and, and get you all your juices flowing, your, your uh, thoughts turning about what habit or perhaps better uh, routine in your daily life already, it could be spiritual or, or not in your mind, however you want to frame it, what routine is already something that you look forward to with great intensity uh, or, or just with joy? What, what are some routines that you love in your own life? Um, don't be shy. Go ahead and just turn your microphone on if you want to, or use the comments if you prefer not to talk uh, in the chat section. Um, but but don't be shy, jump right on in. What are some habits that you like, some routines that you already uh, enjoy? And introduce yourself when you, I know you have micro, uh, your names written under you, but some of you are there as groups, some of you are uh, there with numbers next to your name, so. <clears throat> well, this is Diane. And uh, my little habit that I have right now is getting up at in the morning and having tea and toast with nut butter. <laughs> that's my, that's my ritual in the morning. That is Before fantastic. I do anything else. <laughs> that is fantastic. Uh, I, I have to pull a quick aside and say that this morning I was working on my sermon in the early hours, reading it out loud to myself and our youngest gets up at six and he came down and and for a multiplicity of reasons, he didn't, he, his normal routine was interrupted. And he said, dad, can I read what you're, what you're working on? I said, well, I'm reading it out loud. If you just want to sit and listen, you know, cause every preacher's kid wants to hear the sermon at least three times. Um, and he said, sure, dad, I'll listen to it. So he heard it. And there's a segment in there about addiction. And at the end of the, the sermon, he said, well, dad, that was really good. That, I love your words. There were some colors there. And I said, well, I'm done. So you can go and play now. And he said, great. And I said, I'm going to go get some coffee. And he goes, that's good, dad. Just don't be addicted to it. And then he started laughing. <laughs> so I um, some of our routines, I, I, I just want to uh, raise my glass to Diane and to Allison, who have both uh, listed coffee as part of their morning. I see a lot of you holding your glasses up. A lovely routine in the morning, the caffeination of the morning. What are some other ones? Oh, come now. Don't be shy. This is Terry. Greetings, Hi, Terry. everybody. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when I was in boot camp, one of the uh, officers said, talk, talk to the recruits uh, and said the thing that you have to do is you have to accomplish something. And you, you do that by the first thing when you get up in the morning is you make your bed <laughs> and then you've accomplished something. You've done something and that'll steer you on to the rest of the day. <laughs> I like that. I like that. How about others? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd be remiss in not pointing out that, uh, uh, Monday through Saturdays, I get to start my day with about, uh, eight to nine other St. John parishioners. We do morning prayer. Uh, the Psalms are lovely. And the readings, uh, uh, as Judy can probably comment, the readings of the Bible are uh, sometimes pretty, sometimes they really fill your soul and sometimes they really are quite challenging. Mm. Uh, we're doing revelations now. And uh, <laughs> that's... Uh, that's a little strange, but, and then afterwards we have a short coffee hour where we all meet together on Zoom and, and have, have our coffee and uh, uh, just enjoy each other's company. So that's my mornings. That's wonderful, thank you. And, and uh, yeah, and that all of you are welcome at that. I hope you'll take uh, the invitation seriously. It's a lovely place to begin your day, a great routine. Um, I see on the comments, some comments about reading art books at, and listening to hymns in the morning. Uh, Tom says taking walks with Elaine. 
Um, Sarah says taking uh, starting with a devotional um, and and a cup of tea. That those are very you know important sort of the 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 physical and the metaphysical at the same time. Oatmeal porridge, coffee, daily morning prayer, centering prayer, evening prayer, making supper. Thank you, Craig, for those. We all have routines uh, that that mark our days and. Uh, if you haven't heard it already in the, the course of this month, part of the work of discerning your own rule of life is really looking at the routines and practices that you're already doing and seeing where they uh, fit with something holy and nurturing of your life and faith and your, your life in general. Um, the, the habits that we're already doing might be a part of a rule of life. Um, what I want to do is get some discussion going and, and ask you... Uh, a little bit about what are some of the things that you've been thinking about that you do that you feel nurture and nourish your own uh, spiritual life right now. Uh, so not just the routines that you've named, although some of them probably are in there. And this may be a bit premature in the process because we're about to examine the other habits, the other practices, but where do you feel there is something missing in what would be a well-rounded and balanced rule to guide your days? What is something that you're yearning for more of? Um, so take a moment and, and think about that. And, and then if you have something uh, and feel comfortable sharing it, please do share with us. Something that you feel you would like to add into your routines and habits, something that you feel is missing. Yeah, go ahead. Who, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> There's 29 other people. Um, yeah, uh, actually, in our house group, we discussed the, the, um, this topic, the uh, rule of life, and we all agreed that we really do participate in a rule of life, not just through habits, but also through uh, St. John's groups that we participate in. I try to do the morning prayer, and um, one thing you asked that was missing, I think maybe more... Uh, contemplative time. And I think Ed uh, participated in this in our church back in Lexio Delray Divina. Beach, Lexio Divina. Mm. We thought that would be kind of cool to just take a passage from scripture or a poem or something and have a small group just discuss where do you see that? Do you get a spiritual message from that? Just the way Lexio Divina works. But other than that, we I think our group realized that we really do have a rule of life. Some are more, a little bit more structured, like uh, Benedictine following the rule of Benedict. Others, um, just through routines, we have a rule of life. Um, making a point to come to Sunday service is part of the rule of life. So we have it, we just don't identify it as such. But I would like to see maybe more contemplative. That's in my life, I, a little bit more of that. A contemplative practice, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, and I think a, a gap for many of us uh, in, in sort of modern life. Uh, when I took sabbatical, one of the things we named for both myself and for the parish uh, was we named that something that's very much a part of our common collective life is, is the doing. St. John's is a community of doers. We, we're, we're happy with many activities, many, many actions throughout the course of a season together. Um, and perhaps almost too comfortable to the point of squishing out space for silence, rest, and contemplation. And that, that during the sabbatical, at least, we wanted to bring in those practices and try them on for size as a faith community. And so the whole uh, project for those three months at, at St. John's and for me as I was away were, were practices of hospitality, uh, presence, storytelling, listening, contemplation, and rest which became a way to reflect on what was missing and to try it on for size. Um, I think that's an important thing that we need to do from time to time is to check our, our whole system and say, what's the piece missing? What are some other things that you yearn for that are missing from your current habits and, and practices? Jim Johnson, I see your hand up. Oh, oh. oh sorry. And then Holly. I think I, okay. I, can you hear me? Yep. Um, well, my wife, as you probably know, is a retired psychotherapist. And um, sometimes I think I'm her um, <laughs> first client because I have 
I have needs sometimes, so I'll try to be real brief here. But um, when uh, COVID, I, when you said, what are you lacking? And I thought, people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. but Lucy is, is, says she's Zoomed out. She's tired of Zoom. But what she is doing um, that I think is really, really wonderful is she's making a list of people she hasn't seen for some time, particularly people who are alone. And then she tries to call one of them a day. And that's been really, really, she enjoys that a lot more than being in a group like this. Although what we really would like is to have people come over to our house. We've been totally isolating since March 13th and we don't see anybody other than on Zoom or on the telephone. So anyway, but that's my thought. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. And then Holly and then Elaine, I think, were the order there. I uh, saw Craig's chat about walking, and I it was kind of an overarching thought to me because for me, walking in the morning used to be a habit. I mean, for many months until it got cold. And so now I've been trying to think of what I need, and I need something that's like that walking. And for me, that walking was not only um, physically stimulating, but it, it brought some kind of peace to my head too, because I was outside and breathing fresh air. And some of that I can't replicate walking in my house, you know, because I'm not outside and I'm still in this place that I've been in <laughs> for months, um, as Jim just said. So it's, a bit difficult for me to kind of figure out right now how to take that habit that I had before and somehow transform it into a new habit that has that same um, uh, that same effect for me. Absolutely, and and I think developmental psychologists have shown with children that um, that play outdoors has a different effect than play indoors. And that there's something about like the eyes being able to take in non grid like patterns and uh, organic shapes along with the fresh air and the movement and the feel of the contour, the change in the lines when you're walking and moving, your body is, is taking in all of that often imperceptibly to us. And in, in, in aggregate it is what makes us more human, more whole, more able to learn more able to be in relationship so absolutely it's uh it's an important piece elaine uh up to you um the thing that i find missing or i miss a lot um and jim already mentioned this were was being able to be around people being able to hug them uh being around friends and family we're fortunate that we um we have contact with our grandchildren uh, we watch them part-time and, and also with our son and daughter-in-law. Um, and But well, as with all of us, um, you know, we've missed family weddings. Um, just Thanksgiving, my family all gets together in Louisiana. That's not going to be happening. I, but it's not just us. It's for, for you know, a lot of people. But I, I guess it's that um, being able to hug somebody, you know, other than your family are, are to be able to do things together, you know, take a walk together, uh, go out to eat or, you know, that, that, so I, I really miss that. And um, I'm really cognizant of the fact of how hard um, I've got people around me. I'm not by myself, but for people who are single or, are in a bad relationship, you know, how hard it must be for them. And with winter coming, um, some of the pe people I call it Episcopal homes, it's going to be really bad for one person. The other two people are able to socialize, but one person was more on lockdown and they finally got to start going outside to visit, but they can't do it now with cold weather. So, mm. so it's, it's human connection yeah, for me. That's really helpful, Elaine. And I think um, I'm I'm not surprised. In fact, I'm heartened that we're naming kind of our present context, right? That we're talking about a rule of life and we're also talking about our current crisis, what we're in the midst of. And it it it, it should be said really clearly that that the whole uh, 
experiment of Christianity, the whole, the whole uh, enterprise uh, was generated in the midst of crisis and, and has, and has existed for ma the majority of its history in, a, in places of great trial. Um, and so rules of life, monastic rules of life, communal rules of life, even if you look at the book of Acts, as I know we did uh, back in our scripture section, all of that has as a, as an, a kind of an umbrella over it, this sort of pervading sense of, of challenge and crisis and conflict and, and, um, and the church has always existed. It's only in sort of recent centuries in particularly it just in the West where Christianity has, has been afforded this kind of generous container um, in, in the way that it has. Um, even when it was state sanctioned all the way back by Constantine, there were these plagues and, and, uh, and wars and things that have always afflicted Christianity from without and within. Um, so it is important to remember that our rule of life is, is meant not for good times, though we hope for them, but for times of great challenge to keep us human in the midst of inhuman moments. Um, and right now is one of those deeply inhuman moments where we, we cannot touch each other. We cannot be in the room together. And I hate to turn any crisis into an object lesson, but certainly a, a thing we can take from this time, I hope. And I certainly notice this on those rare moments where I'm outdoors with another person, not from my house, is that I, I'm much more intentional as I enter into that time, thinking about what do I want to say to this person? What do I want them to hear from me? Uh, what do I want to ask of them? That the intentionality of just that time of relational per, interpersonal interaction is so much more like well thought out in my mind. And I hope that after the pandemic, I don't revert back to taking for granted that I can be with people and that I can see and touch and hug them, that I don't take it for granted that I can come into community, um, how, how beautiful it is. I wanna read this quote uh, from Holly out loud because Craig shared it, uh, or for Holly, sorry, from Craig, uh, from Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, if you all are not following along in the chats, this should just be named out loud. Above all, do not lose your desire to walk. Every day I walk myself into a state of well-being and walk away from every illness. I have walked myself into my best thoughts and I know of no thought so burdensome that one cannot walk away from it. Thank you, Craig, that is, that is powerful stuff. Wonderful, wonderful. Others, uh, Judy, you've got your hand up. Yeah, the, um, since we're, we are talking about sort of where we are in this moment, um, I know the thing that, that I'm, that really the, the pieces that feel like they're missing out of my practice right now are worship. Um, I've done the Zoom worship from St. John's a few times, but it's just, it's just not the same. <laughs> it's, um, uh, there's something about being together in person. Um, and, um, and so I miss that. And I used to, um, when I was younger, um, I used to go to a church that um, uh, had uh, Sunday morning service, Sunday evening service, and Wednesday evening service, um, one of those kind of churches. Um, and I was so involved that I was there almost every service, um, uh, sometimes teaching Sunday school, but um, most of the time in service. And I really, I really miss that. And I mean, it was full service. It wasn't just like a little sort of compliment or morning prayer kind of thing. It was full thing. And, um, and I really miss that. Um, the, but the other piece that is hard right now for all the reasons everybody's talked about, um, is the service piece. Um, you know, there's stuff that I can do for the church through the church in terms of formation and that kind of service, but um, doing things to help people's physical needs going out in the community to serve. Um, I, I, for me, that's, and I think for most of us, that's really, that's a spiritual practice and a place where I encounter God and um, find a lot of joy. And 
um, not being able to do that and is really hard yeah. um, right now. And so I'm really excited to put that back in to my life at some point. So absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think I saw above uh, you and uh, Barbara having a sidebar conversation about one of the things that's uh, hard is that some, Barbara says, some of us who resist being told what to do makes it hard to follow a rule. And I, 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 think, uh, I think that is so true for, for most of us. Uh, I, I notice it, I have an 11 year old in the house now and um, there, is, there is nothing that gets done if it is, you must do this thing. Um, but if if we if we let him choose, he will more happily and gratefully jump in. There's this sense of autonomy that comes with a, in adulthood, and all of us are now, in, at least in theory, a, adults. Uh, although the as you, some of you know, working with the Journey to Adulthood program, we know that uh, manhood and womanhood, or or full ma full physical maturity, is a biological truth. But adulthood is something that we earn or grow into. Um, and certainly part of that is wrestling with rules, rules and authority, rules and regulations. Um, today, that is front and center in the gospel. Uh, what law is the greatest among these, Jesus? And he says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these hang all the other laws and rules and prophecies. But it's still hard. Uh, it's important to note and maybe this was covered last week, but um, that that rule is conceived, at least here in this way of love material, as something that is gentle, kind of a, a thinking in terms of internal regulation. I, uh, to bring up my children again, we're going through sec in second grade, uh, the kids are learning their emotional states and they've got them in color zones and they're inviting children to come up with strategies. If you're in this zone, but you need to get back to a calmer state, what are the things you can do that will self-regulate. So regulating ourselves, regulating our, our, uh, our fears, regulating our hungers, regulating our extremes. Um, and so it's meant to be a gentle thing. Uh, as we approach 930 here, uh, what I want you to do, if you have at your disposal a pen or a pa pen and paper, uh, do this. If you're on your computer, which most of you are and not on a handheld device, and it's easy to, to, to type, do that as well. Uh, just to make uh, two columns down, either a sticky note or a piece of paper. On one side, the first part of our conversation, just put down habits. And, and, and at, at some point in the next few days, start to note down your habits, actually take stock of them. Don't just think about it and sort through them. Our minds can, the more linear of us can do that. We can stack things pretty easily and hang on to them. The less linear of us need to put them on a, on a document somewhere. So document it so you can see them in a linear way. What are the habits that you already are a part of? And then look at your hope for right on the other side, what I want for a rule of life. What are the, the things, the outcomes uh, of, of a rule that I would be hoping for? Is it to feel more grounded, more connected, more uh, able to experience love? Is it to be able to share love more easily? Is it to be in touch with God in a better way? Whatever you think are the hopeful outcomes, write, write those down. And then on, a, on the back or on a second piece of paper, go ahead and, and do this second part of the conversation. What, what is missing from your current habits or perhaps what needs to be trimmed out of your habits that will help create space for an outcome that you're looking for. This knowing God and experiencing love and connection and hope and all of those other wonderful things. That can be your project uh, in, in the week ahead. Um, it's something that I think as we go through this material together, the way of love material, you'll, you'll begin to see it take a little better shape and a little bit more clear as you understand the different habits and, and where they show up in the life of the church. Um, is anybody else? Yeah, Tom, you got your hand up. I was going to say that the one thing that I don't do that I wish I did is journal my day, you know, at the end of the day, sit down and 
and reflect and write down what was done, what I intended to do, you know, all that stuff. I, um, I don't do that. And I think that's a really, I, I admire the people I know who do, and I wish mm -hmm. I did. So over this eight or nine months, hopefully that'll uh, start up. Thank you for that, Tom. Yeah, it, uh, I think it's important to name too, um, apropos of Barbara's observation and, and Judy's echoing, um, that a rule too is, if it's gentle, is also meant to be flexible or adaptable, right? At stages of life, we find different things are needed more than others. Um, and so while there may be some really serious tent poles like walking or prayer or centering prayer, that, that there may, be, may come times when journaling is really needed to work through a particular spiritual issue or growth. And there may be times when it just is unfeasible. Um, I know right now for me that uh, while running has always been an important, very important part of my spiritual life, I find that with the way we have everyone living under one roof at one time, it's almost impossible to find a time in the day when, when I can do it, when I can actually get away from either work or school for the kids or getting the meal on the table because everything is squished. Um, so I'm finding other ways, like when I take the dog for a walk, that's my outdoor time. So I was never a walker as some of you are, but I'm finding that that is my, my habit for right now. It's needed to be adaptable. Um, for another, uh, my routine has often been to cook when I needed to, to unwind at the end of the day. It's sort of the, the transition point from work into home life comes through the creation of a meal. It's sort of taking work energy and transforming it into hospitality and energy. And now, again, with time, a lot of cooking has had to be simplified and, um, and changed. And so it loses some of its initial joy and delight. And so I'm having to see the hospitality energy in a different way, finding different places for it. Um, I have, this is Diane. Um, Hi, Diane. I, I think um, people saying, you know, they're not able to do service for others. Um, <clears throat> Terry and I are in a situation where we do not go out at all. And so what I am finding um, is that I, I had to make room in my heart for gratitude for all the people that are doing things for me. And so that's almost a new habit of, of expressing gratitude every day for everything that um, friends and family are doing for me on a, on a weekly or daily basis. Thank you for that, Diane. Yeah, I think uh, habits, I, I've noticed a few of our members use their social media to post a daily kind of recap of gratitude, like what am I grateful for today and share that with the world kind of planting seeds of gratitude back out into the world of, of taking, taking stock. And sometimes that gratitude taking can, can remind us of the fundamental thing that we, as Judy opened us with it, that we do these rules in community, that, that this is about connection. This is about creating a space in which love is possible, where we can share it and receive it. Um, and for some of us, that means we need to, need to be able to, to stay home. So others are, are doing the work that makes that possible. Um, yeah, Mark. You know, one thing that's on my mind in this conversation is that as much as it can be difficult to uh, find the self-discipline to, to, to have a rule of life, and as much as some of us get uh, worried about things being imposed upon us from without, um, I think what I've been aware of in the midst of, of these pandemic conditions is the cost of not having a rule, the, the cost of not having structure. And one of the big, big challenges for me has been needing to be the, the primary, if not only agent in structuring my, my time. In other words, there aren't routines that I fall into because of other people I'm around doing the same things. And instead, if I don't want my time to be a, a, a shapeless blob, um, it's, it's, it's on me to make it structured uh, and and that 
lack of an opportunity to plug into what other people are doing um, has made has has made it just that much more difficult to keep that discipline going, to keep those uh, th those activities that structure a day in place, um, because there's not a broader community that's that's helping out in that effort. Mm. Thank you for naming that. I think um, one of the one of the benefits that our forebears in the faith had in communities that were sort of at least nominally Christian was the 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 order of the praying life was a part of the sort of the structure of society. And so you can you can imagine when the bell tolls at noon during Eucharist, the farmer in the field knows to turn towards the steeple because there is the there is the the Lord being remembered again and made real in the community. And there was a there was a present reminder. And in our life, uh, you're absolutely right. We kind of, especially in this blob, as you said, this of time, we can lose that structure even more so because there aren't just secular everyday regular habits, let alone, as some of you have already named, the lack of being able to connect in in faith community worship and, and other ways. There isn't that sort of weekly marker to sort of tick the next week off and keep going again. Um, and so creating those is important. I think some of you have heard the invitation already to daily morning prayer. Uh, what a what a gift when we don't have bells that we can hear around town, but a majority of the people in here probably have at some point checked their social media feed during the day. And to see that reminder, worship is coming, you can join us. Um, I think of our Muslim brothers and sisters who who have that kind of internal clock and a call to prayer each day, five times a day, to be able to do you know the the spiritual practices necessary to structuring your life. Um, and I, I think, and this will probably steal some of the punchline of today's sermon, but part of our job as people of, of faith in a community is to create the conditions for each other. So that's why we bind together. That's why we don't do this enterprise on our own, is that we're here saying, like, what can I do to help you be better in prayer? What can, uh, I, hey, I need your help in guiding me through this dark night of the soul. Hey, I'd like us to come together to study this thing that seems missing from our community, from our larger life. Um, there, that's, that's what we do as people of faith is we actually let our rule guide us into strengthening the container where love is possible, where, where the way of love is actually doable. We need each other. And yes, we need to be able to also structure it on our own. That's sort of a yes and. Um, Stanley Hauerwa says uh, that one of the reasons why loving God and loving neighbor is so hard is that we actually don't really know what love is until we experience the law and the prophets, until we actually study what, the, what, what God says about love. And that means we have to do that in community. We have to be reminded of what love is. It doesn't just come to us intuitively. Um, we need the, these communities. Um, yeah, Daniel. Yeah, uh, in uh, talking about prayer and the dark night, we were in the morning prayer group, we were talking about starting um, for the season of Advent, just for the season of Advent, mostly December, November 30th at like 4.30, doing evening prayer, which would be much, it's not going to be a half hour, maybe 15, 20 minutes, if, if there'd be interest in that, we're, we're looking at uh, doing that. That's wonderful. I'd heard tell that that might be in the offing. I think it's wonderful. It's sort of when I um, when I came to St. John's, many of you know this because you've been there much, much longer than me, but we had morning prayer was a part of our Sunday morning routine. Um, and it came about when I got here once a month. But before that, it had been a, a, a Sunday by Sunday experience. And as you know, from studying together with us, if we went through the Book of Common Prayer, the morning prayer was meant to be that sort of order, that structure, that that made possible a Eucharistic life. And so it was the sort of, it was the foundation level. And to see over the years now, as, as we've added in uh, Compline weekly, uh, all, all year round, and then uh, we continued with our regular offering of quarterly even songs. And now every morning, morning prayer uh, during the week, Monday through Saturday, and, and this potential of offering now evening prayer, that that structure is, is thickening. And, 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 and even if only a few people are doing it, that is part of the, the sort of 
that's the they're do, the you you all in showing up are doing something for the community. You are holding a structure in place that makes sense of Eucharistic life together. Even if we're away from it for this season, it makes it makes sense. Um, yeah, go ahead, Otto. Yeah, uh, one of my frustrate my mute no one of my frustrations is uh, when I think about everyone here is that in my imagination you all live in these little boxes. I don't see people as fully human anymore, and that's it's 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 kind of funny, but it's very sad. Yeah, um, with the same backgrounds, the same you know positions. That's how I see you. Um, the other thing that Ed and I have, and I really appreciate everyone's comments, you know, uh, Holly and Jim and, and uh, Judy and Mark, really good points. One thing Ed and I do during our routine four o'clock tea and five o'clock cocktail hour is now we're saying, who haven't we talked to in a long time? So we'll just flip through our contacts and say, oh, what about so-and-so? And we just pick up the phone and, and call. So that human contact, we can't have the physical, but there's no reason why we can't have that the human contact, and it's been really rewarding to do that. Absolutely. Uh, friends, I have to slip over to worship now that it's uh, 20 minutes of, uh, I, I'm, I'm late to that, is, but that, that's okay. Um, if the conversation can just continue for another few minutes here around uh, both the what you see as desirable in a rule of life, what you might personally experience missing right now and longing for, uh, both in the chat and in um, audio, and Dave can call on you as you raise your hands. Um, thank you for this uh, kickoff and such a great turnout for it th this month to the way of love. And I look forward to seeing you as we jump in with both feet into turn um, uh, next month. And I know you'll hear more about that in our communications. It's just good to see you all, see you in worship, and take care. Okay, Mark. Just to pick up on the point that, that Otto just made, and a couple have mentioned this earlier, um, I, I find that for me, the delightfully subversive thing to do these days is precisely to talk on the telephone with somebody. Um, it's, it's so counter to the, the, the prevalence of Zoom conversations, of video conversations, and there's something that shifts for me when it's just a voice and just the, the, the receiver uh, up, up to my ear, um, it provides a focus, and and it feels like a kind of uh, welcome throwback to a bygone era almost. That that gets me even nostalgic and aware of forms of connection with others um, that that are ironically intensified precisely because it's only only the audio. It it, it provides for certain opportunities that. This format, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I really enjoy this format and being with all of you in this setting and, and with others. Um, but there's something about the telephone that is is a, a, a welcome corrective somehow to the state of affairs in which we find ourselves these days. That, that's what, can you hear? Oh, you just muted yourself, Jim. <laughs> okay, is it now? Can you hear? Yes. Uh, well, that Mark's point is that's exactly what my wife says. She says, "I know what these people look like, but I can concentrate on what they're saying better if I don't have to look at them." That's exactly the point you're making, I think. Judy. Um, this is kind of getting back to some of our, our previous discussion about rule of life in general. Um, and I, um, for those of you who were interested, I posted some links in, in chats, uh, in the chat for um, resources, because I found keeping a planner, kind of a planner journal, uh, combination has been really helpful for me um, to, to pick up on what Barb says um, because there's nothing really, and this has been the case with me for a while um, because I've been going through this job transition and, and a bunch of other things, 
And so my life has been very unstructured. Um, and so making some decisions about what I want to have as primary uh, priorities in the structures of my day um, helps to uh, keep me from getting distracted. And so it's, it's a way to remind myself of my priorities. And so it's not it, in the sense of it being a rule. I loved what Jared said um, uh, last time or the time before, I can't even remember, but, uh, or maybe even Kate said it, oh, it was Kate, um, that the rule of life, it wasn't a rule like a prescription, like these are the things you have to do, but it was more like uh, a rule, like a ruler, like, how do I straighten out my life? Like, how do I get things lined up? How do I line up my priorities with, and my, my daily habits with what I actually want to have in my life? How do I create the habits that move me toward the life I want to have? And so I've been using a planner and a journal and all this to, you know, like I've got my check boxes and each day it's um, do the daily readings, spend time in prayer, exercise, do something creative, um, uh, work on my writing projects. And so it's, and I don't, almost no days do I check all the boxes, <laughs> but, but I've got my five or six boxes of stuff that I want to have as my priorities for that day, for every day, for, you know, it's my structure of my day and that might, they might show up in different time blocks, but it's my reminder, these are your priorities. These are the things that matter to you that you want to focus on. And um, there's the, I think, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Stephen Covey introduced the idea um, years and years ago now of the tyranny of the urgent, right? That, that there are these things that impinge on us. And most of us don't have the tyranny of the urgent these days, um, although some do, like Mark and <laughs> Jared and Craig, um, have uh, lots on their plate. And some of us have almost nothing. But it's that I think we do, we're all susceptible to being tyrannized by the immediate ask, whether it's the the stuff of our work and family life or whether it's our own impulses and but to have something in place that helps us instead focus on what's important instead of what's urgent and we have to decide what's important right i mean that's the point of the rule of life is we we through prayer and through discernment and through community think seriously about what's important to us and then try to structure our lives and in a way, and it can be a fluid structure, um, but so that, so that doesn't get lost in that tyranny of the urgent, whether it's the urgency of our own impulses or the urgency of outside asks. Um, so that's been really helpful for me, just to, to keep a planner, to keep a checklist, um, cause it's a reminder to me about what's important to me. So. I know that we're running up against, uh, we've got one minute left if anyone has anything they want to say. <laughs> um, otherwise, uh, I hope to see you all in worship. I see you, I guess, in the comments on YouTube saying peace to one another, <laughs> but, um, Otherwise, uh, next week, I think it's Judy, you're on again um, for the introducing the first proper practice in this way of love curriculum of turn. And so I actually don't really know what that means. So I'm looking forward to hearing, <laughs> hearing what a, you have to I say. A, can I give a quick minute plug for that? Yeah, so yeah. turn is um, the, hmm. our more colloquial way of talking about the practice of repentance. And so what does it mean to turn toward being fully human, fully who God calls us to be, turning away from the things that that uh, 
that undermine the image of God in us, turning away from those things and toward full life in Christ and full life, fully living out the image of God in our lives. So that's what we'll start talking about next week. Great. All right. So I think, I think that's it. Um, I'll see you all in worship and have a lovely week.